Uh, we're not going to do much new stuff. So, of course, last time we talked about the first principle of finite induction. I didn't do any problems. Um, I was trying to squeeze everything in because we missed, you know, Tuesday. So, um, what I'm going to do is uh, try to do some problems today, and then um, I'm going to talk about the second principle of finite induction, which if you've started the homework, you know, maybe you know, number 14, I believe, uh, uses this second principle, which I didn't get to just yet. But um, we'll talk about that. And basically, the only thing new that I'm going to do is, is talk about that principle, and then we're just going to try to get through a few problems, um, try to, you know, get you prepared for the homework. Um, induction, of course, as I said before, this is a very, you know, I mean, it's, this is a very common proof technique, not just in number theory, but in, in mathematics in general. Um, most of you have done this before, but, but I just want to, you know, kind of go slowly through the first part just to make sure that everybody's sort of up to speed on this stuff. And, and then we'll probably pick up the pace a little bit, but initially, I, I you know, I think it's, it's best to err on the side of caution and go more slowly than more quickly in the beginning. So that's the plan. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, just sort of remind you again what this first principle of finite induction is. And again, I'm aware that most of you have seen this before. Um, then I'm going to do a uh, do a problem um, using induction, and then, and then, like I said, we'll move on to the second principle. So um, what I'm going to do, for the most part, I'm just going to start the, the labeling over again. Um, but this is just a continuation of uh, what we did last Thursday. Okay, so um, again, let's just, hopefully this is going to get better here soon, but uh, let's, let's recall um, theorem one, which was the first principle, like, like I said. Yeah. God, this thing is awkward. Okay. And again, this is called just the first principle of, I'm just going to call it induction. <laughs> I don't have anything to practice on, unfortunately. This doesn't belong, as far as I know, this doesn't belong to the math department, so we don't, we don't have any of these gadgets. And I don't have an iPad or any of these things, so I, I just I don't have I don't have any any way of practicing, unfortunately. Okay, I'm thinking about writing in cursive, and I think that might make this a little bit easier. Okay, so we've got our our set S that's contained in n, right? We talked about this before. This this n denotes the set of positive integers. Okay, so the first condition was that uh, 1 is an element of S. Of course, if you have this in your notes, there's not necessarily any good reason to write this down again unless you just kind of want to reinforce this and you think that it'll help you. But the uh, second condition is that for all natural numbers n, or in other words, for all little n and capital N, if, and this is a conditional statement, if n is in S, then the next positive integer is in S. Right? Okay. And the conclusion is, that this subset S is actually equal to the set of all natural numbers. And I try to give you kind of a heuristic argument as to why that was true. I said I would give you a formal proof using the well-ordering principle, but because of time, I don't think I'm going to do that. I think time will be better spent just talking about some problems and kind of showing you what I'm expecting in terms of work. Um, so, of course, we're going to get to plenty of the formal stuff here when we start actually, you know, proving some of these, um, these exercises. So I don't think I'm going to say anything else about this for now. Um, so, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is, let's see if I can, hopefully I can squeeze this in here. Um, I'm going to start, again, I'm going to sort of start slowly here. And uh, again, for those of you that are old hands at this, I apologize if you're bored, but um, I, I just want to make sure that everybody is on the same page here. So, 
Let's do an example. And so let's look at the following. Um, the book, this is actually a little bit easier than the example. I think that the examples that the book starts with, but um, I want to start with something that's easy to, to digest. Okay, so for every positive integer n, let's let, um, sorry, let's let p sub n be the statement. I'm going to put this in quotes. Um, let's see, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, sorry. Let me, let me change the notation slightly here. Oops, wrong thing, okay. Uh, there we go. P of n instead of sub n, okay. And it's going to be a statement. And it's going to be 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way down to n equals n times n plus 1 over 2. I believe you assigned that as the homework problem. <laughs> okay, I was just warning you. Is this, is this homework? No, it's okay. Is, is this actually one of your homework problems? Yeah. Oh, okay, well, that's, that's fine. I don't care. That's okay. Um, let's see. I thought, I thought what I assigned were, were a little more complicated than this, but okay, well, that's, that's fine. That's okay. I'll, I'll still talk about it. It's okay. Very first one. Okay, okay. Um, okay, well, that's, okay, good. That's even better, actually. So, um, yes, I'm not used to this. I'm not used to this. So, yeah, I, I'm going to try not to treat you like your Calc 1 students, but this is all I've been teaching uh, since I've been here. So, uh, I'm very glad about that. Um, okay, so I want to be clear about this, too. Uh, this is a, a, this is a proposition, okay? Um, we're going to end up, proving this, that this is actually true for every positive integer n. But for now, you just treat this as an assertion, which may be true or false, okay? It is true, but in general, I don't want you to think of it this way. This is just a statement. Um, okay, so just to make sure that everybody is, is on board here, um, first thing I will say is let's just actually look at a specific case of this. Um, P of 4 is what? It's, okay. So this statement just says that, this, the assertion is that the sum of the first n positive integers is equal to the very last one in the sum times the next guy divided by 2. That's what this is saying. But don't get hung up on the letter n. You know, it could be k, or it could be n plus 5. It's just the way that you interpret it is 1 plus whatever that last guy is, that sum is that guy times the next guy over 2. That's what it's saying. Okay, so P of 4 then, of course, is just the statement, and it's 4, right? So this is just 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals 4 times 5 divided by 2, right? That's what P of 4 is. And you can check this. All right, so the left side is 10, the right side is 10, so this assertion is true. So I was going to do some other ones here, but of course, I assume you, you guys are, you know, you've done this stuff before. You, you know, if I said, what's P of 3, you could tell me exactly what that is. So what is, uh, what's P of 1? I'm not going to write this down. What's, what's P of 1? What's that assertion? It's an equation, right? It's not a number. Right. So just, yes, that's right. And I'll just, just say it'll, there's sort of a shortened version. P of 1 then is 1 equals 1 times 2 over 2. Right? Because n is 1 in this case. You can write that down if you want to. I'm not, I'm, this, this thing is already still awkward. I, I don't think I'm going to do that. But, um, okay, so hopefully that's clear, at least what these, what these statements are. Okay. And um, what we're going to do now is, 
actually prove that this assertion, this, this P of N assertion uh, that I gave you is actually true for every positive integer using this first principle of induction. Okay. Um, so let's call this example two. Now this, I, I'm going to, some of you may ask this, like, oh, do you expect me to write all this exactly as you write it in the homework? No, I don't necessarily. I'm going to be a little bit more verbose about this just because I'm just trying to explain everything where it's coming from. Um, before the end of class today, I will try to tell you a little bit more of what I'm expecting as far as streamlining some of the things that I'm saying. But for now, I'm just trying to get the idea across as clearly as I possibly can. So I'm going to say a little more than maybe you might say in, in your homework. Okay. So <clears throat> the problem is to prove that um, this holds, as I said, for, for every positive integer. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot 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 plus n equals n times n plus 1 over 2 for all positive integers n. Okay, so as I said, I'm, I'm going to take, take my time on this. Um, okay, so I already gave you example one, so this, this P of N that you're going to see is just going to be the same P of N that I just gave you on the previous page, okay? Uh, okay, so we... must prove that P of N is true for all natural numbers. And I'm going to switch back and forth between using natural numbers and positive integers just because I, I want you to equate these in your mind because they are the same thing. Okay. So going back to this, this first principle of finite induction, if you remember, um, if you have a subset of n that has the property that 1 is in there, and it, whenever something is in there, then the next guy is in there, then that subset has to be all of, all of n, right? And so if we want to prove that this statement is true for, for every natural number n, I'm not going to write all of this out, but, and you don't have to either. But the point is, here's the idea, okay? You're going to let, um, even though we're not writing this down, we're going to let S be the set of positive integers and for which P of N is true. And we want to show that S is everything, right? In other words, P of N is true for everything. So using this, this first principle of finite induction, it suffices to show that 1 is an S, and whenever N is an S, then N plus 1 is an S. In other words, P of 1 is true, and whenever P of N is true, then P of N plus 1 is true. And then the first principle of induction then gives us that S, in fact, has to be everything, which is exactly what it is we're trying to prove. Okay? So, <clears throat> Let me just say what it is ex exactly that we're going to do. So we will show. Okay, I'll label these here. So one, P of one is true. And two, some of you that have, uh, those of you that have taken discrete may recognize this first, um, this first task as the inductive step, or the, sorry, the, sorry, the base case of the induction, and the second, the inductive step. You may have heard that terminology before. Have you heard this? You guys, from, okay. Whenever P of N is true, So is P of N plus 1. Okay, so then if we can do this, then theorem 1 uh, says that P of N is true for all N, right? Okay, 
So let's just go ahead and do this. Let's, let's go ahead and verify these two conditions. So the first one, I'll just circle this. Um, I should say, and, and again, those of you that have done plenty of induction know this, um, the first part showing that your statement is true for n equals 1 should generally be very simple. Okay? This shouldn't be something you need to do much um, for. And in general, some of these problems you're just going to say, duh, obvious. There's nothing to say. You know, if p of 1 is 1 equals 1, well, okay, that's true. And there's just, you don't have to go into a long explanation. Well, you know, by the tautological philosophical principle number 4, blah, 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 don't do that. Um, I mean, just, you know, things that you know from second grade you can just assert, okay, um, that's fine. So, um, as I said, so the first thing we're going to do is just verify that p of 1 is true. And um, as we said before, I'll actually write this down. P of 1 is the assertion that 1 equals 1 times 2 over 2, right? Okay, so everybody clear on this point? And all you have to say is clearly true. That's it. Okay, 1 times 2 over 2 is 2 over 2, which is 1. You don't have to write all that out. Just clearly this is true. Okay, so now the second part, I'll tell you what, I'll, let me just wait till everyone's copied this. I'm, I think I'm going to go to a new page so I don't get stuck in the middle. Okay. Is everybody okay? Want to have this down now? Okay. All right. So the second part. is you'll just say, okay, we're going to assume that P of N is true. And we must show that P of N plus 1 is true. Something you might find useful um, as you're writing proofs is to just keep track of what it is that you're assuming and what it is that you want to prove. And then it can't hurt just to be very explicit and say it, not only for my benefit, but for your benefit, so you know exactly what it is that you're trying to do. Um, so again, remember, this, this principle of induction, the second condition um, from Theorem 1, part of the hypothesis, is that if P of n is true, or if n is an s, then P of n plus 1 is true. It's a, it's, it's a conditional statement, if then. This is an implication. So what you're doing is, if you want to prove an implication, well, we, you know, you, you might say, okay, well, if it rains tomorrow, I'm going to stay inside. Um, so you're not really, in some sense, you're, you're not really saying anything about what's going to happen if it doesn't rain. You're saying, but if it actually does happen to rain, then you have a conclusion. So an if-then statement, if you want to prove it directly, what you do is you assume what's called the antecedent or the hypothesis, and then you prove the consequence. Okay? That's the direct way of doing this. And so in general with induction, that's, that's what you're going to do. Um, so I'm going to just write it uh, this way. And I, I'm going to use this language because I think it's a little bit it's su suggestive, which is what I want. Um, so what we have, I'm using the word have, and I want you to think of this like this is a fact. It's in your hand. You can use this fact, what I'm about to write, you can use to prove that P of n plus 1 is true. Okay, so we're assuming P of n is true, so that means that, of course, I, I, in example 1, I defined what this, what this meant, right? So there's no, nothing's really left to the imagination here. 1 plus 2 plus 3, all the way down to n, that sum is n times n plus 1 over 2. Right? That's our assumption. And we have to show and I'll 
label this a little bit differently here. Let me use a, an actual star here. Okay, P of n plus one. Well, what is, so we talked about what P of four was, right? Here's P of n. So P of n plus one then is just, instead of the sum from one to n, it's the sum from one to n plus one, right? On the left side. And instead of n times n plus one over two, it's n plus one times n plus one plus one over two on the right side. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what it is that we have to show. Okay, so I'm going to condense this slightly. So this just becomes n plus 1 times n plus 2 <coughs> all over 2. Okay, is everybody going to see where I'm getting that? Yeah? Okay, good. Okay, so here's what you're going to do. And in general, you know, you, you may have some, there are some problems. I know I think there's, there's one in the homework um, that deals with an inequality called the Bernoulli inequality. Um, so you may not always be proving equalities. You may be doing inequalities. Um, so the point is, the assumption, this P of N assumption, as I said, that's why I'm using the word have. You can use this. You can do whatever you want to it. It's, for all intents and purposes, it is a fact. It's true. And you use that to get to where you want to go, which is here. Okay? So if we know that the sum from 1 to N is N times N plus 1 over 2, we have to prove that when we go all the way up to N plus 1, we get N plus 1 times N plus 2 over 2. And this is what we have to work with right here. So think about what we need to get on the left-hand side. We need to get 1 plus 2 plus 3. I left this out, but the, the term before the n plus 1 is n, right? Okay? And we have that up here. So what's the only difference between the, the left sides of these equations? Well, the bottom one has an n plus 1, whereas the top one does not. That's the only difference. And I can use this as fact, the top one. So if I want to get down to this, it, it, would see, it seemed reasonable then that we might want to try to add n plus 1 to both sides. Because then at least the left-hand side is exactly what we want. Then we just hope that the right-hand side can be made into what we want by factoring or something. That's the idea. You guys with me on this? Okay. All right. So that's exactly, as I said, that's exactly what we're going to do. So we're just going to add n plus 1 to both sides of this asterisk equation. Okay, so when we do that, what do we get? Well, we get n times n plus 1 over 2 plus n plus 1, right? Everybody with me on this? Okay, so what is it that we want the left-hand side to be? We want it to be n plus 1 times n plus 2 over 2. That's what we want to prove. So all I have to do is try to make this into that. Okay? So you're just going to fiddle with this using some basic algebra, and it'll fall out without a whole lot of work. Really. Okay, so let's see. Well, there are actually multiple ways you, can, you could do this. Um, I'm just going to, I think, going to go with the kind of the most natural approach here. Okay, so we want this to become n plus 1 times n plus 2 over 2. So one thing that might be a, a reasonable thing to do first off is to get a common denominator here, right? Because then at least we can combine and we'll have a 2 as our denominator, which is exactly what we want, and we'll just hope the top will factor, that we're done. That's it. Okay. So n times n plus 1 over 2 plus 2 times n plus 1 over 2. Okay, and as I said, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i just go through this kind of slowly, just make sure that everyone's with me on this. So, um, we can combine the numerators here, of course. Uh, you're not basic algebra students, so I assume you guys can follow this. All right, so, I, even, even so, I'm still going to go through this kind of slowly. So this is n squared plus n plus 2n plus 2, right? Which, of course, we're going to combine even more, but that's certainly true. Okay. And so what is this? This is n squared plus 3n plus 2 all over 2. All right. 
Now, what we want, right, is to get the right-hand side to be n plus 1 times n plus 2 over 2. So what we would want is for this to factor as n plus 1 times n plus 2. And it does, the numerator, right? And that's it. You're done. <clears throat> okay. Now, um, really, at this point, you might say, well, what do I need to say at this point? Uh, therefore, you know, by the first principle of finite induction, this P of n is true for all positive integers n. Sure, that's a nice way to end it. If you want to just end it like this, that's fine too. You've clearly established what you needed to establish, and any, you know, math, well, of course, mathematicians don't prove things as simple, really, but um, would, would say, oh, well, yeah, of course, that's done. You've, you've done exactly what you wanted to do. So you're, you're good. Yes? <laughs> no, I don't. I, I mean, there's there are a lot of different conventions here. There's a little, a little open square, a filled-in square, QED, you know, ha. I mean, there's lots of things that you can say. Oh, I'm done. LOL, yeah, you suck. Um, uh, don't say that. That's that's disrespectful. <laughs> but um, no, you can do whatever you want. I mean, if you have a convention that you like, that's that's fine. But you do yeah. Oh, um, I mean, if you if you wanted to to leave uh, to finish like this, that's that's okay. Because okay. you you have done what you needed to do, okay. and that that's fine. Yes. I do think a little differently. Mm -hmm. So I would take the star equation mm -hmm. and copy it out. Mm -hmm. Where on the left hand side of it, I would replace the one plus two blocks up to n mm -hmm. with the right hand side of this, the the asterisk equation. Right, right, right. And then just. Um, yeah, I, I would, I, I know what you're saying, um, except the problem is that you don't want to make assertions being true before you've actually proven them. So the, the, the problem, the slight issue is saying n times n plus 1 over 2 plus n plus 1 equals n plus 1 times n plus 2 over 2. You're, you, that's what you're trying to end up proving eventually. So I really would rather you not do that because you are, you are making an assertion that hasn't been verified yet. So the point is, don't make claims until they've actually been verified. Here, we haven't done that. There's, we haven't assumed what we're trying to prove yet. I know what you're saying. Then you just simplify so that you get 5 equals 5 or something like that at the end. But, 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 logic, but that's not, that really is not the best way to, to write the proof because it's, it's, there's a part where it's, you're assuming what you want to prove. Well, see, my argument is, Hang on one second. Well, No, 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 but you haven't proven you haven't proven this yet. Right. So, but 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 if you if you write if you if your next step is to write and maybe I misunderstand what you're saying. Yeah, I know what he's saying too. We were taught to do it the same way. Okay, let me. Do you have it written down? Maybe. Yeah. It's where he where he's going to step three and he's plugging in the equality for one plus two. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're just saying at this point right here. You're saying here, and then just replace this with n times n plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. I thought you were saying something else, and that's what you what I thought you were saying. No, no, no. Sorry. What I thought you were saying is something that a lot of people do, and so that's why I kind of interpreted it that way right away. But yes, that's fine. That's okay. Yes. Yes. Oh, I, I think I saw what you thought he was saying. Oh. If that was the only way you could see to do that, wouldn't you have to assume it? wasn't true, derive a contradiction. And then that, I mean, that, okay, it that. Be, it wouldn't be pretty. <laughs> yes, yes. Logically, that would be okay, although, yes, like you said, it would not be a pretty way to go about it, but that's one way you could circumvent that issue. Um, but, yeah, what you said is fine, um, and just to be clear, it is not the case, certainly with proofs, that there's only one correct proof in general. That is not, that's certainly not the case. Um, the only thing I, I want to want you not to do is what I said before is, is, is assuming what it is you're trying to prove somewhere in your argument. That's the only thing I want you to avoid. I assume it's true, therefore it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so since we know it's theorem 1 and 2, hmm. if we use it again, do we have to explain what it is? Do you know what I'm saying? No, no. I mean, um, you know, really I'm looking for, for these induction proofs using the first principle of induction. What I'm really looking for is that you... Um, clearly establish the base case and the inductive step. As far as, as actually mentioning it explicitly, you don't really need to do that because uh, you know, this, this algorithm is very well known. And, and so you don't, it's not, of course it's not wrong if you're very clear and verbose about things, but it's not something I expect that you would have to do.
Any other questions? Yes. Oh, um, I, that's a good question. Um, because I haven't come close to writing the exam yet, I don't know, right. honestly. <laughs> we can definitely talk about that close to the time of the exam. But I mean, you know, if it has it in the problem, oh, yes. If it's induction, we don't need to. Yes, yes. Are you using the principles? No, 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 no. <laughs> no. And, but yeah, but, you know, also if I say, you know, use, um, use the first principle of mathematical in, or finite induction to prove blah, blah, blah. Then if it's specifically, say, I say that, then yeah, I would definitely expect that you would do that for sure. But no, you wouldn't have to be that, that explicit. Any other questions about this? No? Okay, good. All right, so what we're gonna do now is, and this is, like I said, this is the only new, um, this is the only new thing that we're gonna talk about today is the second principle of finite induction, which, by the way, um, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let me just go ahead and write this down first. So... Second principle of finite induction. Uh, by the way, this, everybody else in the universe calls this strong induction. Okay? So just letting you know, in case you see this in a future math course, strong induction, that's, that's what this is. <clears throat> I, I'm going to just stay consistent with the book unless the book says something that's actually wrong. Um, so I'm just going to call it this just because that's what it's going to be called in the homework and such. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what everybody else calls it. <laughs> okay. And it just says this. Suppose that S is a subset of N and it satisfies two conditions. Oops. All right. First condition is that one is an element of S. This is just like before. And the second condition is a little bit different. For all natural numbers N, if, okay, so here's the difference. If all the numbers, all the, the positive integers less than or equal to n are in S, then n plus 1 is in S. And the conclusion then is the same. Then the set S is actually equal to the set of natural numbers. Okay. So um, I'm probably not, just for the sake of time here, I'm not going to go into um, a written explanation of this. But you can see the difference is that the assumpt the, the for the second condition, the hypothesis is stronger now. Instead of just n being an s, if you remember that was the first principle of finite induction, now everything less than or equal to n is an s. Um, so why is this true? Well, it's a very similar argument as before, right? So why does s have to be n equal to n informally? Well, the first condition says that 1 is an s, so the smallest natural number is in there. The second condition says that whenever you know that 1 through a certain number, all of those are in S, then the next thing is in S. Okay, so the second condition says because we know 1 is in S, 2 has to be in S. Now we know that 1 and 2 are in S. And by the second condition, 3 has to be in S. Right? 
Now we know that 1, 2, and 3 are in S. So by the second condition, 4 is in S. Right? So that's the idea. Um, as I said, I want to spend more time actually working problems than, than going over the kind of the foundations. So um, intuitively, I think it should be, if you think about it, it should be pretty clear that, that this is what's going on. So what, what's the point? Why do we have these two principles? Well, here's the idea, and this is where the word strong comes from. Very roughly, if, and this is, this is very informal now, but if you can prove something by the first principle, you can prove it by the second. Okay? Uh, why is that? Well, okay, this is kind of a mouthful, but I'm just going to say this. So if you can prove something by the first principle, what, what, what is it that, that we, uh, what, what was condition two for the first principle? If n is an s, then n plus one is an s. So basically, if you can prove that n plus one is an s just by knowing n is an s, then you can certainly prove that n plus one is an s knowing that one, two, three, four, all the way up to n are an s. It's a stronger assumption. Okay, so that's the idea. And so now there are, there are situations, and I'm gonna do an example for you here in a second, where instead of, just so to prove that p of n plus one is true, it's not enough just to know that p of n is true. You actually need to know that that the other guys below n plus one are true as well. Um, and so um, again, I'm getting ahead of myself now, but I'm going to say this and I'll repeat myself again. But um, how do you know the difference? How do you know when to use what? Okay, um, and it's it's basically just when you have a situation like that, um, when to prove that. P of n plus one is true. You you can't do it just from n. You need maybe n and n minus one and n minus two. That's when strong induction or the second principle of finite induction applies. Okay. So, let me just because again I want to get through a couple more examples here. Let me do um, this example. Actually, what I'm going to try to end up doing is uh, number thirteen from your homework. You have to do number fourteen. I'm going to talk about number 13, which uses strong in induction. I, I will say strong induction because it's just easier to say. But that's what I mean the second principle, right? <clears throat> okay, so suppose that the numbers a sub n are defined as follows. And so again, number 14 is, is similar to this. Okay, so the first three are just explicitly specified. A sub 1 is 1, A sub 2 is 2, A sub 3 is 3. Okay. And after that, we have a recursive definition. A sub n is the sum of the three preceding guys. A sub n plus one plus a sub n, sorry, a sub n minus one plus a sub n minus two plus a sub n minus three if n is bigger than or equal to four. So then, okay, I assume most of you have seen this. I'm just going to do a couple of these real quick just to make sure everybody understands this definition. The author calls this inductive definitions. Really, that's not really right. The word is recursive. Induction is something that you use to, to I mean, informally to prove theorems. There's, there's something you may have learned. If you remember implicit differentiation maybe from Calc 1, that's a special case of a more general theorem called the implicit function theorem. Um, and in this case, these definitions come from, from a very general abstract theorem called the recursion theorem. Um, so really when the author says inductively defined, it's, that's not really the right word. It should be recursively, and that's the word that I'm going to use. Um, okay, so what is A for? Well, okay, so now we have to use this recursive definition, right? A sub 4 then is, if we plug in 4 for n, it's A sub 3 plus A sub 2 plus A sub 1. Right? Okay, so what do we want here? We want 6. What's a sub 5? Anyone? Uh, 11, I think. 
11. Are you, are you guys getting this? You guys see this? Um, okay. So the second condition just, again, just says that for n bigger than or equal to 4, a sub n is the sum of the three previous ones. That's it. So as you go along, you can just keep knocking them off as you go down, right? And so now I could easily find a sub 6, right? It's a sub 5 plus a sub 4 plus a sub 3. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about this? Okay. I, I just assume that you've probably seen this before, so I'm, I wasn't going to spend a lot of time on this. Okay. So, et cetera. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to prove something and we're going to use the, the, this principle of strong induction. In fact, what I'm going to do is incorporate another problem that I think I assigned to you. Um, I'm not going to have time to actually do it, but um, I think I gave you, um, I think I assigned this. I think I gave you um, number two in the homework, right? Okay. <coughs> And um, I'll tell you what, because, again, because of time, I'm, I was going write, to write this number two down because we're going to use it in the next problem, but I, I don't think I'm going to have time to do that. So I'm going to refer to it um, here in a bit. So let me show you. How this is goes. So I'm going to we're going to do another problem now using the strong induction. Okay, and this is going to be notation as in the previous example. Um, we're going to prove that a sub n is less than 2 to the n for all positive integers n. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Okay, so I'm going to try to get, I'm sure, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll have plenty of time to get through this one. If I, have t if I have time, I'm going to talk about this Bernoulli inequality problem that you have to do in, the, in your homework. I'll, I'll help you get started on that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use theorem 2. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So again, second principle of finite induction. It's much quicker just to say strong induction because that's what everyone else calls it. Um, so what is it that we're doing? Well, it's, it's very similar to, to the problem that I did before with the first principle. So the first thing we want to do is just verify the assertion is true for n equals 1. And then instead of assuming it's true for n and proving it's true for n plus 1, you assume it's true for 1 through n, and then you prove it's true for n plus 1. That's the only difference. But the strategy in general is the same. It's just that now you have more to get your hands on because your assumption is stronger, so you have more to work with now. Okay. And instead of writing this p of n, you know, I'm, I'm not going to write that now. So I'm just going to say, okay, well, what's, if, we, if we let p of n be a sub n is less than 2 to the n, P, sub, P of 1 then would just be A sub 1 is less than 2 to the first, right? So that's, that's our base case for the induction in this case, right? You guys with me on this? You with me? Okay. So again, we're going to, I'm going to label it the same way that I labeled the other one. So 1, okay, and I'm going to be very clear as to what it is that we have to show. We must prove, or we must show. I, I use this word show very loosely here with the base case. A sub 1 is less than 2 to the first. All right, that's our base case for the induction here. Well, okay. <laughs> What's the definition? A sub 1 is 1. So 
a sub one being, excuse, excuse me, a sub one being less than two then is obvious then. So that's the first part. That's it. That's all you have to say. And as for the second part, okay. <clears throat> now we're going to let n be a natural number. There are a couple of ways, of course, to do this. Again, I, I want to be very clear, as I said before. I'm not saying that this is the only way to do it. This is, I have to do something, though, so I have to choose one of the ways. This is one way to do it. If you're not sure about your way, if, if you want to ask as I'm going through this, that's, that's fine, too. Um, and assume, sorry. Um, Let's assume that the assertion is true. In other words, a sub n is less than 2 to the n, or a sub i is less than 2 to the i, for 1, 2, all the way down to n, whatever n happens to be. Right? Well, I'm, I'm saying it because I'm writing left to right. So I, I don't mean it from a mathematical standpoint. <clears throat> so, um, what is it that we have to show? So, we must prove that it's true for n plus 1. Um, and let me just use the same notation I used before. I'll just use this star again. So, the assertion for n plus 1, then, is the assertion that a sub n plus 1 is less than 2 to the n plus 1. Right? Is that okay? All right. Okay. So, um, I'm going, there, there are a couple of ways you can go with this. Um, I'm going to do it this way because there's, I think it makes my point a little bit better. So what I'm going to do is, we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to consider a few cases. Case one, so we don't know what n is, right? Maybe n is one, maybe n is two, who knows? We don't know what it is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take care of the easy cases first. And then we're going to assume that n is big enough so that a sub n is defined in terms of the, of, of the three previous guys. And then we'll use that strong induction hypothesis to, to take care of that. Okay? But remember that a sub n is a sub n minus 1 plus a sub n minus 2 plus a sub n minus 3 only if n is bigger than or equal to 4. Right? If, it's, if, if we're on a2, we don't have three previous guys yet. So we can't, we, we, we can't apply that yet. We can only apply it when we know that the subscript is bigger than or equal to 4. Because we need to have at least three previous guys in order to use, right? To, to use in order to get a sub n. So, the first case is n equals one. Well, then we're just done by part one because we just do, we just verified that, right? We're, we already did that, so we, we don't have to do that again. We, we already did it from from the top. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so well, let's see. So we have to show. Sorry, uh, maybe I was a little unclear. We already know that a sub one is less than two. We already talked about that. So we still have to show that a sub 2 is less than 4 now. Right? That's, that's, that's our assertion when n is equal to 1. You see that? When n is 1, the assertion is we have to prove that a sub 2 is less than 4. You guys with me on this? So in this case, we have to verify that a sub 2 is less than 4. But this is clear because, by definition, a sub 2 is 2. OK. 
Okay, so you should have that in your notes, right? The first three, right? A sub one was one, A sub two is two, A sub three is three. So this is, this is clear just from the definition. Okay, these are the sort of the, the simple cases. Case two, n is equal to two. And then what's the assertion we need? We need for a sub three to be less than what? Eight, right. So we must check that a sub 3 is less than 8. Again, that's clear. OK, this is clear since a sub 3 is equal to 3. OK. So if, if you, you, there's one way, another way to think of this. You could sort of think of this as sort of the base case of the strong induction argument, okay? In a sense, okay? Because we can't, we don't know that a sub n, remember, we don't know that a sub n is a sub n minus 1 plus a sub n minus 2 plus a sub n minus 3. That's only true when n is bigger than or equal to 4. So we have to take care of these simple cases first before we know that, okay? Now the next case is when n is bigger than 2, Right? Then n is bigger than or equal to 3, so n plus 1 is bigger than or equal to 4. And now we can use the recursive definition in this case, because we know we're big enough so that we can use it. Okay, does everybody have this down? Okay, so the third case is not going to be that, that n is equal to 3. The third case is just that n is bigger than 2, and then that, that'll take care of everything. <clears throat> Okay, so again, I'm going to write down, just to be clear, just to remind you uh, what it is that we have to show. We must prove that a sub n plus 1 is less than 2 to the n plus 1. Okay. Now... <coughs> By definition, okay, um, <clears throat> so we have to prove something about a sub n plus 1, right? Well, we know what a sub n plus 1 is in terms of the previous, some of the previous terms, right? Um, again, I, I don't have this. Um, on the board, I don't, I, I, on the screen, I don't think it's going to help to, sc to scroll back. Um, a sub n, this is in your notes already, a sub n is a sub n minus 1 plus a sub n minus 2 plus a sub n minus 3 when n is bigger than or equal to 4, right? So if, n, again, like I said, if n is bigger than 2, and, and n is a positive integer, if it's bigger than 2, then it has to be bigger than or equal to 3, right? So n plus 1 is bigger than or equal to 4. So then we can use this recursive definition then, because we know this subscript is bigger than or equal to 4. So it's the sum of the three previous terms. What are the three previous ones? a sub n, a sub n minus 1, and a sub n minus 2. You guys with me here? Okay. <clears throat> now, now we can use our assumption, and now I'm, I probably am going to scroll back one just to make sure that everybody remembers this. Okay, let me wait till you're done writing this. Okay. So remember what, um, let's see, oops, sorry. Um, okay, so... Um, one more. Okay, there we go. What are we assuming? We're assuming that this assertion that a sub n is less than 2 to the n, we're assuming that that's true for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up through n. Okay? So we're assuming that what it is we want to prove is actually true for 
n, n minus 1, n minus 2, everything below n plus 1. Okay? So since n is less than n plus 1, n minus 1 is less than n plus 1, n minus 2 is less than n plus 1.